If you quit when you're told no, it was never your dream to begin with. My guest on this episode of Passing the Torch is a podcast host, senior master instructor for Cycle Bar, type 1 diabetes, diabetes advocate, and motivational speaker. She's also a mom, wife, lover of coffee, and chicken wing connoisseur. Boom. <laughs> Without further ado, passing the, uh, the passing the Torch with Samantha Redden starts now. First and foremost, welcome to the show, and thank you for joining me. Man, you did your homework. Uh, thank you. I appreciate <laughs> that. Th thank you. I'm excited to be here. Thanks. Good. How is this going to help you? You talked about pageant prep before yeah. I just started doing the intro. So how is this impromptu going to help you with uh, pageant prep? So I'm competing in Mrs. Ohio America in just over a week. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have an interview is 50% like of the score. Yeah. And so they have a bio with basics about us, but we don't know what aspect of that they're going to ask us about. So, you know, I don't I don't know where we're going with this podcast, but I'm like, this is great practice for me. Good. Here we go. And during your interview, you should tell them, Martin Foster interviewed me. Uh, let's talk about slam poetry. Slam poetry. The reason I say that is because I started following you on, on social media yes. and maybe like a month ago, you put something about slam poetry and I saved it and I said, this is good. So I want to, let's talk about it, please. When did I, I, I did bring that up. I brought that up as like something I think that I would consider pursuing mm -hmm. if I had time or it was fun. I can't even remember what I had used it on, but if I, you know what, I think it might've been uh, my phone's over there. So I don't want to go, here, but I think someone asked me what's something random or talent or something, or maybe something, I, uh, maybe I ask, remember what ask it was. me anything or something, yeah. right? Yeah. I know what it was. Yeah. And someone asked if the Mrs. Ohio America pageant had a talent portion okay. category and it does not. So I don't have to come with a talent and everybody, because I'm a senior master instructor for cycle bar and I ride a lot of bikes, everyone's like, oh, you'd ride bikes. You'd do on stage. I'm like, no, I, I do that all the time. I think I would do something like slam poetry, but I think that the slam poetry, I have no experience in do, slam poetry. Is it really, let's just try it out. Just try it out. I don't even know how to begin. It would be like kind of like a artistic rap type deal, right? I don't know. I practiced. Poetry? I came up with one kind of sort of. I want to hear you okay. go. But it's, uh, but it's really just a bunch of words, but it's just about, uh, you have to look serious. Okay. And then um, you have to look, just pick like, if you're on stage, just pick okay. a spot like in the ceiling. There you go. There you go. And uh, just say like, you know, slam, poetry, you know, podcast, haiku, gym city, governments, beauty. I don't know. Just these, that's what I would do. I, you know, it's not a skill that I have, but it is interesting. You know, my mom actually, not to, not to make this about her, but she's a fascinating <clears> one. <throat> she actually, she worked uh, high up in administration at Kettering Hospital okay. and then retired and went back to college to get another master's degree in fine arts. And she actually is a published poet and writes a lot of poetry. She doesn't do slam, um, but she she does a lot of poetry and she's she's the guru, the expert okay. in it all. So I might have to go to her and be like, mom, teach me how to do slam. Is slam like too commercial for her now? Or she's like, <laughs> like you know. Yeah, it's too corporate. Exactly. What's the craziest talent or skill that you've seen, like, that someone do or try or something just, oh, man, I did not expect that. I don't know. I mean, look, I'm I'm new to the pageant world and, like, I, you know, whether we're speaking in that or just in general, but I did have the opportunity to judge uh, the National American Miss pageant, which is younger girls last year. And there was talent and I judged talent. And it was so fun to see these young girls. Like one girl like played the electric guitar. That's cool. One girl did body. But I thought, I mean, don't get me wrong. There were some amazing singers and dancers, but it was really cool to see, um, you know, young women get into other types of activities. One played yeah. the saxophone. Yep. Those to me were like the most fascinating and interesting because I'm such a big believer in authenticity and yeah. like doing what you love, what feels good to you, not what you think is the right thing. Um, or like what you've been told is the right thing to do. So, uh, yeah, it was just cool to see, I think, anything that anybody wants to take on and try and yeah. do is, is cool to me. Like, I wasn't planning to talk about this, but it, yeah. it's a cool, like you brought up the um, judging the the young Miss pageant. I have a 12 year old daughter, so I'm very passionate, just very, uh, I think a lot about the confidence of my daughter and mm -hmm. my self-esteem. But what's a message that if you could talk to every, how old were these girls? And they were as, as young as five up to 17. Okay. So if you had a message that could go out to all the five to 17 year old girls, what's something you would want them to know or mm -hmm. do or yeah. What, what, what would your message be to them? You know, 
it would be a lot of what I tell my own daughter. So I have a daughter who's going to be eight in like two weeks, but it's, you know, beauty starts on the inside. It comes back to authenticity, doing what you want to do, what feels right, what you enjoy. And the truth is society can be rough and they can be tough and they can make you, you know, feel like you're not good enough. Oh. As long as you love yourself, love the reflection in the mirror, whatever that is, you know, that's what's most important. And that's what's going to take you the furthest in life is that self-love. Yeah. And so that's really what I try to teach my daughter and what I would try to teach any other little girl, you know? No, that's great. No, authenticity is the, uh, I consider the new currency. It is. Yeah. It truly is. <laughs> No, that's, uh, man, I love that. Um, before this, I had lunch at Raising Cane's because that's what felt good to me today. I was like, before this podcast, and I was like, I need to go eat some chicken. My husband would agree. Yeah. And I was like, I hadn't had it in a while and it was it was so good. Yeah. But I did want to ask you, because I, I, like I said, I've done some research and we yeah. were, were talking, but, and I have to read this because it's a, it's a lot. Uh, so I saw that you recently co emceed the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, JDRF. Cincinnatians of the year gala. What was that experience like? That was so fun and amazing. So, you know, you introduced me at the beginning as a motivational speaker. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I actually believe it was, it was Zach Pitts who we were yeah. talking about, you know, um, that had said to me, you know, I, I had told him I wanted to get into motivational speaking and he was kind of like, you're already doing it. You are doing it. So why would you not just call yourself that? But along that same realm, it's been a goal of mine this past year to get on the mic as often as possible yeah. in front of crowds of people because I just want to get better at it. And yeah. I believe that you can't get better at something until you just put yourself out there and just start doing it. Well, that experience was awesome for me because I was with Bob Herzog, who is a news anchor for Cincinnati, very well known. So to be up there sharing the stage with him yeah. felt like a gift. And he was so kind kind and supportive and encouraging, which was great. <clears throat> and then um, we had over 600, 650 people there on this huge stage. Wow. So the crowd was like, and this um, is like a black tie affair, black tie event. Yeah. I mean, the event itself, I, I believe raised, I want to say like over, I mean, it was over a million. So That's it's crazy. huge. That's it's awesome. a huge event. And so really to get to that opportunity, it, it felt like a level up moment. I, like I was like, all right, Samantha, you're doing this. It's so in, in line with the way I approach everything in life was like, you got to get a little uncomfortable to level up. And so for me, I was like nervous going into it, but I was also like, what an amazing opportunity. What an amazing opportunity. That's what it felt like. And it was an adrenaline rush. And, you know, of course, when I first started, I was a little nervous, but by the end of the night, I was like, you can't have this microphone back. It's fine. It's fine. So, um, yeah, it was, it was just such a great experience. And I feel like for me really that like leveled up the bar where I want to go with motivational speaking and public speaking and just feeling so much more comfortable with it. Have you had, what was your background like or experience with public speaking? Have you done Toastmasters or did you do it like in college or something? Or? No, not, none of that. So I think really my only experience came from, I worked in nonprofit before I got into uh, the fitness mm -hmm. industry. I worked in nonprofit. So any of those opportunities where I got to be on TV with Zach Pitts and Katie Kenny and, yeah. you know, all, all the, all those. Shout uh, out to Katie Kenny who yeah. has not returned my Facebook messages. <laughs> Katie, come on. So that was kind of the start of it. And then really what I think really leveled, helped me just get more comfortable was working at Cycle Bar because we're on yeah. a microphone in front of a room. Doing that so often and then starting my podcast yeah. a year ago. You know what I mean? You just get more comfortable with- What's the name of your podcast? The Samantha Show. That's right. Very straightforward. I'm going to link all that in the show notes, but I wanted you just to plug yeah. it. So. so I think just doing those things and then just having an interest in it has forced me to want to practice and try it and put myself out there. No, that's, and you have a, uh, you have two kids, right? Only one. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so your, your daughter. So that's, that's gotta be cool to see, like for her to see all this too. Like, Hey, mom's putting herself out there. Right. So I hope so. Yeah. You know, I'm a very outgoing person. <laughs> my husband is my polar opposite. Sometimes I feel my daughter, like really, she's like, I don't need the limelight. I don't need this. Yeah. You know, she falls into dad's shoes, but there are definitely some moments, especially getting into pageantry where she's kind of like, do you think I could put the crown on if you win it or? do you you know do you think maybe i could get a dress and stuff you know so i think like i hope that when i follow my dreams and all these things that i do which i think some people think is just kind of crazier out there i hope that she sees that i'm just about like living life to the fullest yeah. and she feels motivated and inspired to do that as well 
So do you feel like, was there an epiphany or this aha moment where like, man, I need to start, I'm going to start doing these uncomfortable things or these other ventures. Cause I mean, you're doing a lot, right? And I, I mentioned the, you know, the cycle bar, and, but I, I see the stuff on social media that you're working on and, but yeah, was it just something like, you know what, just screw it. I'm just going to, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I think to your point, I realized, I think through the cycle bar journey that anytime you can in a controlled manner, get uncomfortable or kind of cause this stress in your life by doing something that makes you um, nervous, but you really want to do, you get better, you get more confident, you get stronger. Like I'm such a big um, believer in confidence and how we grow confidence and now starting to try to share that message with other people. And the only way you can do that is through that getting uncomfortable. I heard somebody describe it recently as like when you go to the gym mm -hmm. and you work out a muscle and you kind of break it down through that stress, but then it goes back stronger that we can we can create these moments in our life as well, where, yeah, we feel kind of the stress of the moment because we're very nervous and it's scary and it's new. But when we get on the other side of that event or that, that moment, we're like, wow, I did that. Yeah. I think you feel better. You're like, I'm going to do something else. I think I kind of noticed this happening. I like to feel uncomfortable yeah. in a controlled manner, you know, but I'm like, I like to like find out what I can do. In those moments, you mentioned the word stress, like, uh, and nervousness. In those moments, is there a certain word or is there a certain pep talk or speech that you give yourself or is there maybe a quote that has stuck with you throughout your life that, you know, puts you over that hump? I don't know that there's a specific. I think that so much, uh, so many of those moments are typically, you want this, yeah. you want this, you know what this is going to do for you. So it's kind of hyping myself up. I also heard somebody say the other day, like getting on top of the nerves and not letting the nerves get on top of you. So it's not wrong oh. to feel the nerves, but you're like, I'm in control of this situation still, which I, I think about all the time is I'm on top of my nerves. I feel it, but I'm on top of it, which means I'm in control of the situation. And then I have a friend um, who's also a therapist and she gave me this, this little tool, which I really like. And it's like, right before you go into something that's making you nervous, you speak like, to yourself like it's already happened like i crushed him seeing that event i was so calm and controlled i did such a great job but you're leaking like it already happened okay. to yourself so if i was nervous coming in here today like i did such a great job on martin's podcast yeah. he asked all the right questions and yeah. i answered them so seamlessly like speaking to yourself right before as if it already happened and you did such a great job in that moment i love that because i'm someone i, I think you know i've talked about this throughout uh, a lot of my podcasts, the past is, uh, 10 episodes or so is the most difficult conversations we have are often with ourselves. That's right. And for me, I tear myself up with my self conversations and it's tough and I don't know how to get away from that. Right. But I've tried to, well, I, I haven't tried, I have been doing it when I have that, that negative conversation or thought to give myself two positive affirmations mm -hmm. to kind of, you know, double it and everything. What's your friend's name, the therapist? Her name is Maddie Newbecker. Is she live in a Dayton area? She's in Cincinnati. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I'm a, yeah. uh, man, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. going to research more about this because yeah. uh, I'd love to know more. Yeah. Uh, Alex Ramosi talks about that too, like the evidence, right? Like, um, cause I've been, he's been doing like a lot more podcasts and everything. And that's been a common theme. And every time he's a guest is in order to build that confidence, you need evidence, right? And yeah. the evidence is basically just comes down to uh, repetition. <laughs> Hey, going back to the diabetes thing, please ask the JDRF and beyond type one. Yeah. So I will take this opportunity just to share that they, uh, they actually have rebranded as recently as last week. So okay. they are now called Breakthrough T1D. Ask me the question again one more time. Yeah. Just to talk about JDRF and yeah. beyond type one. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so JDRF uh, is now Breakthrough T1D as of just last week. And so their primary mission is to fund research to help find a cure, to advance treatments, to find treatments that prevent T1D. So they're very much involved with the treatment, the cure, the medical side of things. Beyond Type 1 is a different nonprofit that actually Nick Jonas started and is a big part of because Nick Jonas has Type 1 diabetes. Yeah. And so wow. that's more about a community. It's people who live with type one diabetes that are doing amazing things. It's awareness. So, so both of them kind of play different roles. I'm more heavily involved with breakthrough T1D. Um, but I like to kind of just stay connected in the beyond type one community. Cause it's cool to see people do. 
Yeah, yes. and I saw I uh, read that you uh, you're diagnosed at age nine. Yes. So how did that impact you mentally? And that's such a and now um, you look very young. So I don't know how old you are, but like <laughs> yeah. So but with but we'll say within the past ten years, there's more efforts, more knowledge, more research compared to when you were nine years old. But how did that impact you? How did that shape your mindset and just I guess your your upbringing? Mm -hmm. It I first I'll say it is incredible how far the treatments and advancements have come. I mean, it's like technology, like it's mm -hmm. just like booming fast. Um, and so the, the treatment related to type one diabetes has changed that much as well, which has been really cool. Yeah. When I was first diagnosed with type one diabetes at age nine, I was taking two shots a day, um, and then had to be super regulated with what I ate. Yeah. Now I wear a device on my arm that reads my blood sugar, that talks to an insulin pump that communicates seamlessly, that's giving me insulin based on what it is. So I have to think a lot less. I mean, I still have to like pay attention. There's still highs and lows, but a lot more flexibility with what I eat, how I can work out. So all these different pieces. That, so that's been really amazing. I think for me, you know, when I was younger growing up, unfortunately, a lot more people are getting diagnosed with type one diabetes and they don't know why, but it's like boom, boom, boom all the time. When I was diagnosed at age nine, I was, there was only one other person in my entire school district yeah. that had it. Now teachers and nurses are so used to it. Everybody knows how to handle it. So when I first sat, when I was younger, I think I really tried to hide it. I just didn't want, and I never, even to this day, um, like I never want anybody to like feel sorry for me because she has diabetes. Yeah. I'm like, I'm good. Like we're good. And yeah. even like growing up, I was like, I'm good. Like I cheered. I was like, I don't want, we, just, we don't cheer, need to focus. Just slam poetry. Dreams, dreams. But um, I never wanted it to like define me. But I think what it did is it, it made me responsible because yeah. you're taking, you got to keep yourself alive. Um, you're acting as a human pancreas. So I think it made me responsible at a young age, but not in a bad way. I think in a good way, it taught me responsibility. And then as I've gotten older, it's really become like when when something you have something like type one diabetes and you're like, why me? Because there are a lot of moments where you're just like, why me? Like if you're mm -hmm. having a bad low or, or you know, it's numbers are like roller coasters and you're like, why do I have to deal with this? I wish I didn't have to. But I realized like somebody like me who is very outgoing and has all these dreams and aspirations, it's like. I'm in a position where I can show other people who live with type one diabetes that life can be normal. You can go after all your goals and your dreams. And it helps me and helps me answer the question, why me? Yeah. Why me? Because I can empower other people and and make sure that they feel okay too and connect with families. You know, it's it's been it's just a part of me. Yeah. It's so automatic now. I don't even remember life without it. So it's hard to say how maybe it impacted me because it's just who I am. Yeah, it's great that you're using your platform and everything to just to um, just to further, I guess, to cure just a, the messaging and just overall knowledge. Talking for treatment, how important is exercise? Is would you consider exercise like a treatment for it? And if so, like how important is that? I would consider exercise uh, a tool. I don't know if I would say treatment, but I would say for sure a tool. You know. There, I re do remember growing up, I would get very frustrated when people would be like, eat better, work out, you yeah. won't have it anymore. Don't eat candy. I'm like, is that yeah. it? Really? Okay. Eat more fruits and vegetables, work out, and then you won't have diabetes anymore. I'm like, okay. Well, you know, type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease, which means my body attacked my beta cells and my pancreas. So my body just does not make insulin. It has nothing to do with a metabolic disorder, which is more related to type 2. So that being said, exercise is, uh, it helps your body use insulin. When I I exercise, then I typically need less insulin or my insulin works better and I notice more control. Yeah. But for a lot of people, exercise with type one, it can be really hard to get into because it does start to move things. And a lot of people who live with type one don't exercise because it's scary because you can go low. Yeah. Then. It's just another outside factor. But when you can figure it out, it's so important and so beneficial. We'll get to some lighter topics, but I have one more. I probably, but it's, no, I no, like, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. I had this question, but it's, it's like you answered that before I even asked it. It was, I was going to ask you, what are pillars of exercise someone seeking to improve their metabolic health yeah. should understand? But yeah. I feel like you just kind of, you answered that. So, but that's, yeah. I, I'm a huge basketball fan. Yeah. And there was this player years ago. Uh, he, he was a great college player. Didn't have us as, as successful as an NBA career. But anyway, Adam Morrison, he played for Gonzaga. This is like 2003, 2004. Yeah. 2005, but he had diabetes and he, I think he'd have to get shots like, or like get, you know, with the needle during, he'd be on the sidelines sure. and stuff. And it was just, this guy was playing, you know, NBA basketball. Yeah. But, yeah. That's amazing. You know, you've been putting yourself out there and with that, like with risk and being uncomfortable, there's, there's always going to be um, success and failures. Yeah. But in what ways can projects that seem like failures lead to success or pay unexpected uh, dividends? It, 
my favorite failure led to my most success. And that comes all the way back to the quote that you brought up at the very beginning. If you quit when you're told no, it's never your dream to begin with. And so in 2017 is when I auditioned to be an instructor for Cycle Bar. And man, I thought I crushed it. I thought yeah. it was so good. And uh, now I did not pass. And I was like defeated. What's like, the audition? Like, what do you do to audition? So you have to ride a bike. It's recorded on a, on a camera. <laughs> for, for how long? You have to do it's like 15 minutes. But the biggest thing is like you have to ride to the beat, to the rhythm. And they're looking for rhythm, form, and then energy and personality. And you're just doing this by yourself, right? You're like, doing it by yourself. Yeah, I'd be like almost in a room like this with a bike wheeled in here. And then it gets sent to our the Cycle Bar education team. And they review it and they pass or not based on your rhythm, your form, your celibate. Like, are you celibate? <laughs> like, do you have wow. a personality? And so I thought I really crushed it and I didn't. And so I, I was like defeated, really defeated. And um, for like two or three days, kind of, I cried a lot. I don't know why it was so important to me, but it was, it was, it was important to me because I knew I would be good at it if I could do it. And uh, my dad actually reminded me of Lindsay Sterling. And I love to tell this story too. Is she the violin player? She is yeah. the violin player. And I'm glad you know her because she was on Britain's Got Talent and they told her she would never make it. She could never do it. And I've seen her sell out an arena. So it's like, my dad had told me that. And he was like, so you can decide that you're done or you can try again. And so I did. So I tried again, passed, and then worked my way all the way to the top. And now I'm the one who watches the auditions. Wow, that's so great. Lindsay Sterling, she uh, she also does a bunch of YouTube videos where she'll play the instrumental of a song. I think she might have did one for Dance Monkey. Anyway, and I, I mean, but she's done, you know, and it's she's awesome. It's beautiful. She's awesome. But yeah, that's what a great. I didn't realize that. Uh, I knew she was on Bring Down House, but yeah, I know who she is. She's yeah. amazing. They shot her down. Yeah, they that's so crazy. Down. Do you remember the beat to the song or the during your failed audition? Like, is, uh, was it a song or was it just a, like a beat? Do you pick the song or they give you a song? Oh, I picked it. Um, what song was it? Bad Blood by Taylor Swift. I can never oh. listen to that song again. Oh, so you <laughs> listen wow. to it too many times. And then the second one, um, I don't remember. The second one did not stick with me as much, but I can't remember what it was. You know, every time I hear bad boy now, I'm going <laughs> to think about... Uh... <laughs> Chaos on the bike is what you should think of. It was not pretty. Wow, I didn't realize that. That's, that's, I, you never think about that stuff, like whether it's for Peloton or Cycle Bar, any of that mm -hmm. stuff. Like, hey, what does that, you know, that addition consist of? But Yeah, but I'm, I'm so... I'm so glad that I failed that first audition because it lit such a fire in me and... Then when I passed and I really, it was like before, it was like when I didn't pass that I had kind of made up in my mind, I was like, I'm going to do it again. And I'm yeah. going to go be on the same team as the woman who told me I didn't pass. And we did. It took two years, but it like lit a fire. And I don't think if I would have failed that first audition, if I would have had that same drive and passion. No, that's good. I think, I mean, even for like for Saturday Night Live, the amount of people, the uh, the level of people who are who didn't get cast on the show that yeah. auditioned, right? I mean, it's just the, the the list is long, and it's like people who went on to have like these mega successful careers right. as comedians and everything. Yeah. All right. So we talked about slam poetry. <clears throat> we talked about cycle bar, public speaking. What are you world class at that people might not know? I don't know. I put it all out there. What are you good at? Or something that like, well, maybe not world class, but something you're like, man, it's a cool party <laughs> trick. Or, oh. if I, you know, if I'm feeling like maybe drinks are flowing, I might do, you know, like, you know, what? I, it, you know I'm going to try this. I have nothing. I am, I am who I am. Look, I, I got no hidden skills. I put it all out there as I am, you know. <laughs> Got nothing, Martin. I, I'm a good dancer. Okay. I, I can believe I'm a good dancer. Are the talking, are flowing. Are we talking like Dancing with the Stars? Are we talking like Elaine from uh, Seinfeld? That's probably more the, the latter. Um, no, how about celebrity impressions? Can you do any of those? No, oh, I can't do no. any celebrity. Have you been told who you look like? A couple people. The the one I get the most, although it's been a while, is Anna Nicole Smith. <laughs> really? I was thinking Charlize Theron. on like. I, I don't know that I've ever been told that one before. Yeah. So that's a celebrity impression you could work on. Well, thank God it's not the first one. Because I was like, I put that in the grave, Martin. I don't bring that up. Nobody, nobody mentions that to me anymore. So in the last five years, what new habit or belief has most improved your life? 
It's the idea of authenticity. Okay. A hundred percent. I think when, you know, I, I'll share my age. So I'm 36 now, but I think like when I was in my twenties and trying to establish myself in my career, uh, I was working in nonprofit, but then even like when I got into cycle bar, like I felt like I always had to do it like the, do it like the person I looked up to did it. Or like I was thought I was supposed to do it, but I realized truly through the cycle bar journey that it was my authenticity that sold me and like helped me level up every single time. It was like when I was being truly myself that I found the most success. Okay. And even recently within the last, I would say year, like doing things like, no, I want to be a motivational speaker. Like, no, I want to put myself out there. And even in this pageantry journey, like I I did my first pageant last year and I had a coach and I was like, dress me, tell me what to say, yada, yada. And it was fine. I got first runner up in this pageant and but like, even in this journey now, I'm like, no, like I pick my outfits. I'm going to show, like show up how I want. I have coaches, but I'm like, I'm going to do it in the same way. And already the energy and like the momentum, like everything feels so much That's better. Great. So it's just really, I believe that we are vibrating at the highest frequency in that level of like that authenticity, like you said, now as currencies, like I totally believe that. Yeah. No, it's good. All right. You ready for some random questions? These have no rhyme or reason. Okay. It's just, it's just miscellaneous of all the characters from the board game clue. Yeah. Who who would you be? Well, I'm there's a Mr. Mustard, right? <laughs> Colonel Mustard. Colonel no, Mustard. Yeah, Mustard. That's the only one I know, so probably. <laughs> okay. But Bes- besides Charlize Theron and the other person who sh- we shall not name. Yes. If there was a movie made about your life, what yeah. would the name of your movie be? And who who would play you? And who would play Zach Pitts? Who would play Okay. Um well, it would be the Samantha show. Because okay. I like it very straightforward. Um, play me. She's not an actress. I'm not good with actresses. But if I could pick a human to play me, okay, it'd be Gwen Stefani. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, I just okay. love her energy. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Um, Zach Pitts. And let's see, who would be who would play him? I'm so bad with actors and actresses. Well, let's just... give him like Chad Michael Murray. Let's go back to the ninth, yeah, ninety two thousand. Oh man, yeah. I like it. Yeah. yeah. And then he was also in Freaky Friday yeah. with Lindsay Lohan. So that's good. That's an old school actor. You know, I don't know if Chad Michael Murray's doing anything these days, but Hallmark movies, yeah. which I'm very <laughs> fluent with, with my because of my wife. So uh, yeah, Hallmark or whatever. Uh, what's the other? Oh, Jesus, uh, like all the holiday movies. Are you good stuff. with movies? Yeah. Okay. Who is the guy that plays then too? Because he could. This guy could also probably pull it off. He was in the faculty. That that movie that was yeah, about with the teachers and yeah. stuff. Like uh, he's the main guy. I'm trying to think. Um, can you picture him? Oh, uh, I've seen the movie. Yeah. And I remember uh, he's in something else too, but I can't. I'm so bad with actors and actresses. Uh, like man, the faculty. I have to look it up. I feel like that. But whoever that guy is, he could. I just remember Josh Hartnett. Oh really? I didn't think. Was, you know, I'm trying to think of the guy that's. Um, no, that's good. Yeah, I was. Think, I was trying to think of uh, Jordana Brewster's in that movie. But there's a guy in that movie. He's one of those actors. He's in tons of stuff that you don't realize who he is. Like he's in the movie Alpha Dog, and. Um, oh yeah. He, he plays like the 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 wacky like yes. the, you know the yep the, the uh, anyway. I know exactly who you're talking about, but I don't know that. I'm so bad with actors and actresses. I'm, I feel like I'm O for two on these questions. <laughs> No, that, that that's okay. That's okay. There's there's no right or wrong. If your husband was in a pageant and had to do a, a talent or a skill, like what would it be? He would sit on the stage and he would nap, a deep <laughs> nap. He would be able to fall asleep deeply. We could test it to see if he's actually asleep, but he would be able to sit on a stage in front of a crowd of people and then just fall I'm asleep. Of, like, what's your husband's name? Joe. Joe, I'm yeah. proud of you, man. Like that's a that, I'm a dad, man. I get it. So like I'm 42, so like my. My, like I, I love naps. That man, since the day we met, I'm like, how can you nap? He could be sitting in that chair over there, like watching, just be asleep. Oh good just... for him, man. Good for Joe. <laughs> I know, I'm jealous. That's good. All right, I have one last question. Okay. Actually, I'm going to plug your podcast. So, okay. what's the Samantha show about? So, I started it. I got the idea at like 2 a.m. one time, and I was just like, I think I'll do a podcast. I'd like ordered all this stuff on Amazon and had an episode out the next day. I don't think I really knew what I wanted to do with it. I don't know if I still know what I want to do with it, but I have, I really have like three formats. One are my personal stories that I hope are inspirational or pep talks or motivational, whatever they are. I think we connect as humans through um, our personal stories. So, one of them is just kind of like that. The other is inspiring people. People are doing 
incredible things in the community. Or I, I interviewed a guy that did a thousand pull-ups every single day for an entire year, like just wild stuff. Um, and then the third one, the third format is with my husband. So we yeah. will just banter. And, and I, I love you guys' setup, right? Like just the role, like the, the aesthetic and everything. And like, it looks, yeah. uh, looks really cool. Before I get to the final question, do you have like any parting thoughts or like where can people find you? Yeah. So um, I do have a website. It's just don't call me Sammy dot com so i open every podcast episode my name is samantha you can call me sam just don't call me sammy so yeah. my website is uh just don't call me sammy.com and that's really got everything linked to it so my you can find my podcast on there you can find my social media pages um you can reach out to me so that's probably the best place does that happen a lot people could try to call you sammy not as much anymore now now people do because they i've been putting out there that yeah. i don't want to be called sammy but more like i feel like in high school or growing up or they're like oh you're sammy or you go back oh, you don't people automatically call me marty and i do not oh. like being called marty like yeah. money it's martin's a family name i'm very proud of that and i <laughs> yeah. hate being called marty like it drives me nuts but people <laughs> so if there was a giant billboard on the high one well, on the 675 yeah or anywhere in the world with your message and picture on it for the world to see yeah I said on the 675, but where would you want that billboard to be? And what would you want your message to say? And where would I want it to be? Well, I would I want it to be probably in New York City, in okay. Times Square. Yeah. Okay. With all the digital fun lights. That's my vibe. Yeah. Um, it would say, Michael, if you quit when you're told no, it was your never dream to begin with. It was never your dream to begin with. And I think that's appropriate for New York because so many people are out there in New York just trying to make it, whether it's in acting or even in sales or on Wall Street or whatever you're trying to do, right? Like, you know, we're going to have failures, um, keep going. So I think it's a good placement for it too. And then, you know, yeah, just slap my face up there too, because <laughs> right next to Mark. Samantha show. Right next to Mark Wahlberg's. Uh, remember yeah. the Calvin Klein thing? So that's how I like it. That's how I want it to be. Samantha, thank you so much for being on my show. Like I appreciate this, and just you were so responsive to me, and just kind. And um, you mentioned about like I sent you a video about requesting you be in my podcast. Yes. So just thanks for that feedback. And um, yeah, this means a lot to me. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. I I love the opportunity. And like I said, I'm looking for any opportunity to get on a microphone. So I appreciate that you sought me out and invited me on. And yeah, thank you so much.